Welcome to A Plus Show, episode number two. Mark, uh, Michael Apple, my uh, colleague in studio, I'm Ed Hogg. I was quite happy with uh, the response we had to episode one. Yes, I, I think you're trying something new. You're trying it on different platforms, new technologies, certainly technologies I'm not a fan with. And, you know, let's let's give it a go. Let's give it a punt. Let's see how it goes. This is the first time that we're trying something new. So you can wave to everybody on YouTube live, <laughs> Alec Hogg. Uh, we, are, we are streaming this live on YouTube and it's going out uh, on Twitter spaces. That's going to become rele relevant a little bit later, the platform we're on. Uh, but it's good to be here. Yeah, and having it on Twitter spaces was the intention to be able to distribute it throughout the world live. Uh, of course, we have been uh, experimenting with uh, with YouTube Live for a while uh, with our old Biz News Power Hour. And uh, just, just to remind you, if you are coming on Twitter Spaces, you can engage with us. And if you want to say something, just um, press the you want to speak and, and we'd, uh, we'll bring you in. As far as... Face, uh, as far, why am I saying Facebook Live? I think I've gone nuts with Facebook. Have you bought into Meta? Not yet. We're going to buy that in the portfolio, I think, in the next <laughs> time. But, but um, on YouTube Live it is a, a live chat box down the side. So yes. uh, you've got something to comment, put it over there. But, well, what are you going to be talking about today, Mike? So it's going to be a nice blend as always. Uh, it's going to be looking at uh, fuel prices, the announcement that uh, shocked a lot of people that we're going to be selling our strategic oil reserves or a portion of it, a significant chunk of it. What is the Automobile Association got to say about that? Then staying with the theme of fuel and is roads, the deplorable state of South Africa's roads. Anybody who drives around uh, knows that you do it through your teeth. You grin and bear it through your teeth because we know the amount of money that goes towards roads in this country and it is very low down on the priority list for those in government for some reason. And how is that impacting on the country's farmers? So we're going to be looking at um, a recent survey that came out of AgriSA and the impact they're saying that the state of our roads, both tar and gravel, is having on the agriculture sector. Then a little bit further afield, uh, far-right politics rearing its head in France. What's that all about? And then finally, Jacob Zuma. Um, the former head of state is due in court on Monday, the 11th of April, for his corruption trial. Will it start or will it not? Well, Mike, giving you all the news and the politics that you need to know about, I will give you the business information. And tonight we have got two South Africans who are really making waves internationally, grabbing the headlines uh, internationally. We'll be talking uh, and giving you clips as well from Rudolf Boerter, who's been appointed the head of the number one venture capital company in the world, Sequoia Capital, and Elon Musk, who's uh, just simply bought 9% of Twitter. I love the way that uh, Simon Lincoln Reader, our uh, satirist, uh, described it. He said it's like a yuppie going and buying a, a, a MacBook. Uh, it's a similar kind of impact on his wealth, although it was a, a few billion dollars that uh, Elon Musk has spent. Mm. But the impact of all of that... Then we will hear from a very innovative South African home-born business. I interviewed the CEO today. It's called Line Booker. It's the Uber of trucks. Uh, and close off with an interview I did last week with Ronnie Aptika, which is very moving. Ronnie, well-known South African movie maker, lived in Kiev until two days after Vladimir Putin invaded. And he's now having, well, he had to flee and perhaps Ukraine is a long way away from us here in South Africa, but it is still having a massive impact around the world. And who knows what uh, the next development is going to be on that side. But so far, South African NGOs, have, uh, gift of givers, have actually course, played, yeah. played quite a big role. But outside of that, uh, we haven't really covered ourselves in glory. Certainly our politicians don't seem to have. No, no, they have not. So let's get straight to it, Mike, and maybe start off with that incredible story of Rulof Boerter. He's the grandson of Puck Boerter, who was the Foreign Affairs Minister of South Africa, a, a very clever, fascinating character, 
during the apartheid era. In fact, I think Pick did he stay on after 1994 in the government of national unity? He may have. He may have. Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. I didn't research any of that. But anyway, Rudolf Boerta is the grandson of Pick, uh, the son of also Rudolf Boerta, so the, uh, it runs in the family, who's a, a, a top economist. Yes. And he was in the headlines at the Financial Times of London this week. Our partners at the FT, uh, in their daily podcast, had this to say. The venture capital firm Sequoia Capital is a bedrock of Silicon Valley. For the past 50 years, it's backed tech companies that have reshaped consumer and corporate life, including Apple and Google. Yesterday, it announced a rare leadership change. Rulof Bota will take over in July when the current CEO, Doug Leon, retires. Bota now runs Sequoia's U.S. and European operations. This is only the third leadership change in the firm's history. It's an extraordinary story. And let me just give you a little bit of the background. Why I've been following the life of Rulof Bota is because he was the youngest ever qualified actuary in South Africa at age 22. So this guy... He was sure. highly precocious. He is also a close friend of Magda Wizikchus. Went to an Afrikaans school and it said no, he needed to go to a English university. A very Afrikaans speaking up until that point. Mm -hmm. uh, Magda and he were both actuaries. Instead of going into, actuar into the actuarial side, he decided to join McKinsey. And the, uh, the reason for joining McKinsey at half the salary that he would have earned was that he could go into the international market. So off he goes to the United States, lands up in California, and meets Elon Musk, who asks him to join PayPal, which Elon had put together at that stage. Uh, Rudolf Werther turns him down three times. Imagine turning Elon Musk down. It can't be that easy. And eventually, uh, the South African ran falls out of bed yet again, and uh, Elon says, come and join PayPal. So Rudolf leaves... Stanford Graduate School of Business, where he was doing a, a, an advanced degree, and he joined PayPal. He then takes PayPal onto the Wall Street, onto Wall Street, on a, in an IPO at age 28. Uh, he is the chief financial officer of PayPal. Was seen as a bit of an oddity on Wall Street, not just because of the way he speaks with a South African accent, but also being uh, such a young man at a uh, such a high position. And then when PayPal was sold to eBay, and he and Elon and the other PayPal mafia, they called them, uh, made a lot of money from that. Uh, he was asked by Meg Whitman at eBay to stay on, and Rudolf Boerter, all over at this stage, must have been 29 years old, said, no, thank you. He would rather go and join Sequoia Capital, which is the, the great venture capital company. And so help me in his first, his first big investment for them was YouTube, at which time there were three people on the companies. So he's made Sequoia Capital directly more than $10 billion in investments that he's made on behalf of the firm. He's uh, only the third leader of the firm in its 50-year history, and uh, he loves making bolton. Uh, he, he visits South Africa fairly often. He's retained South African roots, but really flying our flag uh, strongly internationally, and is still a, a close friend of Elon Musk. So mm. here we have uh, two guys, we'll talk about Elon Musk a little later, but uh, two South Africans who are showing how, how amazing people are from this country and, and how they can achieve great things when they put into the international community. This job, by the way, as head of Sequoia Capital, is the top job in venture capital in the world because Sequoia is the biggest and, the well, it's, it's a storied firm. So well done to Rulof Boerter, and it's a, it's, I'm very pleased that uh, we're kicking off our show Acknowledging him this oh, week. Two fantastic exports from South Africa, these two gentlemen. You know, uh, Elon Musk and I went to the same high school at different times together. I know that sounds <laughs> strange. <laughs> that is my only link to Elon Musk, the Pretoria Boys High link. But yeah, incredible. A uh, good way to start off the show, Alec. Um, to, well, bad news, but it could have been worse was was the the fuel increase that came in and um, i want to switch over here to the the announcement that there is going to be the deregulating of the price of 93 off and we know diesel is deregulated in the country so effectively what that means is the the government will say here is the cap 
you as the retailers, this is the most you can charge. You are allowed to charge less, and that encourages competition between the different uh, fuel retailers and different petrol stations out there. So this announcement came off the back of, it's, it's one of two plans, a host of plans that, that National Treasury, the Department of Minerals and en Energy is looking at to try and cushion the blow for South African motors, South African consumers at the pump. Uh, because of what's going on in Russia and Ukraine and um, international oil price, the RAND doing pretty well, strengthening. You you interviewed uh, Andres for years a little while back. I thought he back. was I thought he was smoking something very 14 strong. Fourteen fifty, yeah, and it got there. It got there. It's back to about fourteen seventy to the US dollar now. So it hasn't done much in the past week, mm. uh, but the RAND is still holding below fifteen or under fifteen RAND to the US dollar, which is a a strong level and protecting us to to some degree anyway uh, against high oil prices. So, in light of this one rand fifty to protect the consumer, the government came in in Okonongwan and said we're gonna we're gonna drop the general fuel levy by a rand fifty, and that's effectively going to come off the price the increase of the petrol price. So where let's say the price of ninety. Five octane went up by thirty six cents. It would have been one rand eighty six if the there hadn't been a slash to this GFL general fuel levy. And because this one rand fifty per month for April and in May a three rand cumulative loss over the two months that equals roughly six billion rand loss to the South African economy or to the fiscus. The there was an announcement by Gordon Guana that they're going to sell off uh, a chunk a strategic of the strategic crude oil reserves. Now, them, it is rumored, or it is reported, that there's roughly 10 million barrels that South Africa has in reserve. We would need to sell off 60% of our oil reserves then at a time when energy insecurity could be a, a real problem. We are waging one hell of a bet on the fact that we need to, by the end of May, going into June, there has to be some clarity on what's going on uh, between Russia and Ukraine, because then um, we may need to see other more drastic action being taken by the government. Uh, but to be fair on this one, Mark, yes. the, the strategic oil reserves were sold by Tina Jamut Peterson, one of the unlamented former uh, cabinet ministers of the Zuma regime, at under $25 a barrel. Mm. So just as well, that deal was reversed. Uh, also, she sold over everything at that stage So to Glencore, who didn't want the deal to be reversed. It, it was a really, really murky transaction, that one. Anyway, that's behind us. So at least we do have strategic oil reserves to yes. sell uh, or to, to uh, get $100 a barrel from is, is far better. And this time around, I'd wager that there's going to be not too many hands in between uh, what the what the fiscus gets and what uh, in other uh, in other words what what the what we as taxpayers are going to get, but it is it is also interesting that we're not the only country in the world that's doing this. So yeah. presumably the United States also thinks that the Ukraine war is going to have some kind of a conclusion in the not too distant future because it continues uh, yeah. in different well for for years. This could, as you say, it could be quite a risky decision. Yes. So I, I put that question to the Automobile Association's Leighton Beard um, just about what they make of the recent announcements, and this is what he had to say. President Biden is releasing uh, strategic fuel reserves in a way to, to offset rising costs in America. In South Africa, strategic fuel reserves are being sold to cover the cost of this 150 cut to the general fuel levy. It's not sustainable. When that 150 enters the mix again, it's it's all back to you know what we used to do in the past. And that's, let's have a look at what the increase or decrease is for the month ahead. And if it's an increase, it's going to be a big one because it's obviously not going to have this benefit of a 150 slash to the GFL. Good point. However, on the other hand, Treasury is awash with cash right now because of the commodities boom. Flush. It's the numbers are, are beyond their wildest dreams. And the budgeting for 2022-23, in other words, until February next year, has been done very conservatively. So the intention of the Treasury team, and you really got to doff your cap to these guys, was that let's not overdo it. Let's not spend 
Uh, first of all, they didn't spend uh, much of the bonus that came in last year from the commodity boom. And they certainly didn't project that there would be anything like the hundreds of billions, literally, that are coming into Treasury in addition to what was budgeted. So they can afford a $6 billion. Uh, just on that point, very sad to see that Dondo uh, Mogocani, the Director General of Treasury, has re- well, he hasn't resigned, but his contract is not going to be renewed. Uh, he's, mm. going, he's following a path that many uh, members of Treasury have done into the private sector. Uh, Ngisa Fuzili, his predecessor, is the CEO of Standard Bank South Africa. Kenneth Brown is also, was also at Standard Bank South Africa for a while. He was the procurement czar at Treasury. So it's, it's almost like these guys have done their national service. Uh, on Dondo's CV, I think it says it's more than 20 years that he's spent at Treasury. Sure. I, I've seen him in, in action at the budget, uh, in, well, in the press conferences, in, in budget lockup. He's very impressive. So whoever gets him is going to be very fortunate, but we as a country... Hopefully, there's someone just as good to take over. You know, it's interesting, Dondo Mokhojane, he came up at, um, and we'll get to this later, but at the South African Human Rights Commission, the president was asked what he made of Dondo's comments recently that if South Africa doesn't get its expenditure and, and um, doesn't sort itself out from a policy and a reform point of view, we are heading down the road of a failed state. What he said that. As the DG of Treasury, what did the president make of it? What he was asked, and he said, well, I don't want to comment on anything that could be career-limiting for Dondo Mokajan. <laughs> I thought mm. that was interesting. So there might be something more to all of this, indeed. Mike, uh, moving on to the next story, and this is Elon Musk. As we said earlier on, Rulof Goethe and Elon Musk are uh, close friends. They both live in California. They're both really very much top of the tree over there. And Elon, um, this week, made headlines. On Monday, uh, he bought 9.2, or disclosed that he bought 9.2% of Twitter. I don't know, do you follow him on Twitter? I, I, do, I do follow him on Twitter. He's quite yeah. outspoken. He is. About Twitter, on Twitter. About Twitter, on Twitter, saying things like, hey, you know, what is freedom of speech? And then he, he had that poll. I don't know if you voted on it. I did not. But the, he put a poll to his 80 million followers on Twitter. That's, mm. that's a nation. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, a sizable nation, twice the size of, of, uh, of Ukraine, for instance. Mm. And 70% of them came back to say, no, Twitter does not implement free speech. He's now the biggest single shareholder. Yeah. And uh, the, the US correspondent of Lex... Uh, of the Lex column of, again, from our, our um, partners at the Financial Times of London, had this to say. So it's unclear what he wants. Is he trying to just uh, put some of his $200 billion fortune to work? Some have even speculated he could be part of uh, perhaps a buyout group that could take to where probably this had been contemplated a few years ago when hedge fund Elliott uh, and Silver Lake uh, were, were agitating. It's all uh, a head scratcher, but with 10% stake uh, being the largest shareholder, it's worth several billion dollars now. Um, he can definitely make himself uh, a voice uh, in the boardroom uh, if he wants uh, in the way he has on the platform itself. So even the, the Lex column from the FT, they don't know why he's done it. Mm. Uh, is, it is he going to be doing something more now, becoming a director of the company? Because on Tuesday, the board announced, the board of Twitter announced, Elon is now on our board. Yeah. The only board outside of Tesla and SpaceX, his own companies that he's on. So it shows he's, he's pretty serious about this. And he's already been tweeting about how he intends helping them to improve. So um, Twitter is in the Biz News shift portfolio. Thank goodness uh, it did as well as it did. It shot up through the roof. 30%. The 30%. Just because Elon's how much is How much is that to the investors? Well, to our investors, uh, not much, but at least it, it gets that portfolio. It's only 5% of the portfolio, but it gets it a little closer to break even. And if you consider what we've been through uh, over the past three months since that portfolio has been launched, I think a lot of people are breathing a sigh of relief. In fact, we went, to, went into profit slightly uh, in, in the past week, but uh, with NASDAQ all over the place. NASDAQ, incidentally, is down uh, about 2% this past week. Uh, the S&P 500 index down 
one and a quarter percent. Our JSC is up half a percent week on week. And the Jaltec crypto basket is down three percent, which shows you that uh, Bitcoin was down three and three quarter percent. So those are the, the major moves in the market. But the place to have been in the past week, just about the only place to have been, would have been Twitter before Elon bought. But Elon's in there now. He's he's going to make a difference. He bought his shares, incidentally, at uh, much lower than the current share price, around anywhere between thirty-two and forty dollars a share. It's now sitting at over fifty. So he's already making quite a nice profit. It's the chutzpah of the man to to criticize the platform, state publicly he's thinking of starting up his own thing. What do you think happened there, uh, Alec? I know maybe it's an unfair question, but you, you're on Twitter, you're saying you're using the very platform you're criticizing to, to announce almost that you're going to start up your own similar type of platform. There must have been wheeling and dealing going on behind the scenes because um, the founder, the co-founder, Jack Dorsey said, I've wanted him on our board for a long time now. Well, they're friends. He and Jack are friends. And Jack, you might recall, was pushed out. So Jack Dorsey has not is not completely aligned with what's happening at Twitter at the moment. One of the reasons why we put Twitter into our portfolio was because Jack Dorsey's not much of a businessman. Elon Musk is a brilliant businessman. And that's probably what Jack Dorsey is saying. Phew, we get this guy on board, he'll understand how to do the business. You, you never know. It can be, certainly from the way that I've observed businesses, it's so much cheaper to take an existing business, so much, so much better to take an existing business and improve it than to do a startup. And ask me, I've done two startups. It's tough to do a startup. And Elon, thinking of doing a, a startup in social media, would have known all along that if he could get his hands or be part of the solution of an existing social media company, it's a far, far better op option. And that's almost certainly uh, where his mind has gone. Have you seen any trouble looming for him from a SEC, from a securities exchange <laughs> perspective at all? He keeps fighting with him. He actually... He, he's just, he's wonderful, isn't he? He's, he stands up against the man, and the man is the SEC. He's an exchange commission in America. And those who believe rules is rules and you must follow the rules don't like Elon Musk. Elon Musk is a, he's a rule breaker. He's a disruptor. Everything he's done is, it's just, that's his mind. Maybe it came from your Pretoria Boys High School. Not at all. Um, all right, Alec, moving on to something a little closer to home that we can all relate to is the is the terrible state of South Africa's roads. AgriSA on Tuesday uh, this week had a press conference. They went to the five worst affected provinces around South Africa and said to the local farmers, um, give me some input, participate in a survey. Um, has there been any impact on your produce? Bumpiness of roads, think of eggs, think of very delicate fruits that are bound for the export market. Think oh, of Omar's rusks. Think of <laughs> <laughs> Have you had a full box of Omar's rusks recently? <laughs> <laughs> and, and what has been the impact on your bottom line? So there's a profit margin of between 45 and 5% in the agricultural industry, very low margins, high volume. So it's... <sighs> It comes as, as quite a burden when farmers need to invest their own money in fixing the roads that they need to travel and that their trucks need to travel on. Now, this is ludicrous that you have private money funding public infrastructure here effectively. And it was put down at an average of 200,000 rand per farmer that, that took part in this, in, in this survey. 200,000 rand, 200, each, that they fixed, rand each used to fix the roads. There are certain farmers in Harry Smith that paid five million rand between five farmers, million bucks each, to, to do their little bit. And um, there is a, the question was also asked, how, what is, what is, what's the cumulative total of, of produce that is on the roads that, we, that, that the South African economy owes to you? And just from this 311 participants, and these could be big, uh, agricultural companies, all the small men, 311. In other words, just a, a drop. Just a drop in mm. the ocean. It's 7.1 billion rands worth of produce that travels um, and is transported on our crumbling infrastructure. So that is, 
a, a potential of a, a percentage of that, I think 16% is lost because of the bad roads, because of the state of the roads and the bumpiness. And so 16% is the, the knock that they are taking on their bottom line uh, at the moment. So I must be quite a quite a uh, press conference. This it it was, and it was well attended. And there were several speakers. And this is something you're quite passionate about: the disparity between um, those who travel uh, and and produce and and commodities that travel by road versus by rail. And the South African Sugar Cane Association, Sugar Sugar Cane Growers Association, he said that in in KZN. 1% of sugarcane is transported by rail. And that is a shocking statistic. Well, as you know, I was in the Berg uh, this, this last couple of days. Our business conference is virtually fully booked. We're looking for alternative places for our delegates to stay. Mm. And driving up and down those roads, uh, we went near, uh, and it, it sounds like you, you keep, blowing smoke up the guy's backside, but uh, Christopher Pappas, uh, who's running uh, the Howick and Nottingham Road area, has done something. Is because the, the Mgeni? Mgeni, yeah. It, yes. uh, the Mgeni municipality, which is now DA uh, run. He's doing something very good there, because the last time I drove on that road, I got two bow outs. My car hit a pothole, front left, back left. Uh, one that's bad enough, two, yeah. impossible. Yeah. Those potholes have gone. They've been sorted. They've been fixed. So in that little area of the, the Midlands, it is actually all sorted. Sure. On the other hand, going, getting two champagne uh, sports resort our partners there, the roads are still pretty ropey, and they need a lot of support and a lot of help. One, it depends on which road you go on, but if you if you come from Johannesburg, it's a, it's there is a patch which you have to drive very slowly on. So the point that you're making is something that just about all of us who do travel on uh, w- w- minute you get off the highways, the, which of course are privately um, maintained because because of the toll roads, minute you get off those into government's area, it is difficult. And don't forget that we pay the fuel levy to yeah. keep the roads in order. Yeah. So what's happening? So, uh, I mean, there's story after story that came out of this press conference. Um, school children overturned buses. I mean, this is not just about the agricultural sector, but what's happening on our roads, and they just use the agricultural sector as a microcosm of what's happening throughout broader society. Um, there are school school buses that are turning over. The, I mean, the, the images of, of, of some of the worst roads in South Africa, it's... it's um, it's, it's horrendous what, what ordinary South Africans have to get through to get to school, to get to the hospital. There was a, a story about somebody who cannot, the, the farm workers are not taking their TB medication because they can't get to the clinic, because the roads are impossible. And It's good that they're making a, a noise about this. At least Agri SA is, is raising some flags. Is anyone listening? Well, the intention is that this is going to go to the presidency so hopefully the commander in chief can make sure something happens there were figures quoted from the last time something like this happened and i think it was taken to the very top and it was 2011 it's more than a decade ago things have only gotten worse alec but uh, the sound bite you're about to hear is from uh, the free state agriculture's commercial manager dr jack Omer. And um, you about to hear a statistic here about the yellow fleet. And when he talks about the yellow fleet of free state, it's the, the graders. It's the, the massive industrial equipment that they use to, to grade and clean and build the roads. I think our issue has is been total underspending. And the money that is being spent on our roads department is, is going towards salaries. And so this time of the year, from December, there's no money for anything else but salaries. So whatever projects have already been put on the table and budgeted for and tended for and whatever, that's it. And any new crisis that comes up and then we have now flooding events in December, January, and we need urgent repairs, but there's no money to do it. In the free state, we've got 30 graders standing in that central yellow fleet, 26 of which have had pistons through the block. So Alec, that, that 30, 26 have got engines through, have got pistons through the engine block. No, that's crazy. 26 I, is it because they haven't put oil in? 
They haven't put oil in, it hasn't been maintained, or they drive the hell out of them. So 26 out of 30 are doing absolutely nothing. At the and moment. it's an expensive piece of equipment. Yeah. Oh, man. Anyway, hopefully that kind of message is, is, is going to be heard. Just to let you know uh, that if you're on YouTube Live with us, and I see there are dozens of people who are there, uh, please, if you want to participate, just tap in on the live chat there. It's very easy. Just uh, put it in on your keyboard. Similarly, if you are joining us through Twitter Spaces, and I see we've got quite a few people there as well, if you'd like to participate, uh, ask, and we'll bring you on. Interesting. Okay, so moving on to the next story, shall we? And uh, this is Line Booker. I suppose it, it, it flows quite nicely from uh, the, this, the, the, the road because mm. this is a South African-made innovation, which is the Uber of trucking. Now, you've got to just think about this, Mark. I don't know if, if you've, mm. s- you've seen, um, I know you're very observant. So when you're driving on the N3, there are many trucks there that have got loads, obviously have got loads, but there are many that don't have any loads. So I guess what's happening is that the truck is going from Durban, where it's picking up a container from the port, bringing it up to Johannesburg, dropping it off at Johannesburg, and then going back empty. Oh. So what Line Booker does is it brings together, it's a bit like a Uber, if you've got some uh, product that you want to get from Johannesburg to Durban, you, can, you put it on their exchange, people bid for it, bid a price for it. Obviously, if you've made your money on the Durban-Joburg trip, you can uh, offer less on the Joburg-Durban trip, and you might be successful. And these guys are already, after four years, they're already the same size as the big four, Imperial, uh, Barlow World, Unitrans, and Supergroup. Those are the big four logistics companies. They have as many trucks, or uh, they move as much freight as those guys do, and clearly a heck of a lot more efficiently. Uh, when I spoke to the CEO, he didn't, he didn't really want to say too much about the savings, but after we went off air, he said, well, you know, if we can't get the guys 15%, then obviously we aren't really doing a, a, a great job for both the transporters and for those who are moving freight. So let's, let's have a listen to the CEO of Line Booker. Yeah, over the last four years, we've been able to maintain compound monthly growth rates of above 10%. Month on month? You're growing at 10% a month? Compound monthly. Above 10% a month for over the so three years. So how period. much bigger are you on a year if you're compounding it monthly? It's not 120%, it's much more yeah. than that. Yeah, so no, we easily double, double plus year on year. That's extraordinary. Nodia Rodema. I forgot his name while we were talking, but <laughs> Nodia... Uh, he's ten percent. You know, you talk about exponential growth, uh, and and we know just twenty percent a year compounded takes you from two million to eleven million in seven years. We know that from our business portfolio. Ten percent a month, Mike. Jeez. That thing is is growing like topsy. What what are they transporting? Is he giving that Everything. away? Everything. Everything and anything. So if you if you have a container that you need to, as a company, I gave him the example of a friend of mine who is in the tile business. He imports a lot of tiles. So his tiles will arrive at Durban, sit in the harbour, and then need to be transported from Durban to his, to his warehouse in Johannesburg. I'm going to suggest to him that he tries Line Booker out. Because all you do, and what Line Booker does, is they vet the transport company on that, on that side to make sure that you aren't going to be putting your product on or your container on a, on a truck that's going to break down halfway. Mm. They also pay the transport company 30 days, whereas often in this business, you're lucky to get your money in 60 from the company. So, you know, people are, are, are watching their cash flow. So it's, it's a Patrice Motsepe initiative. He's behind them. He's behind uh, Nordia and, uh, and his partner, uh, and uh, Mr. Hoffman. And they, they brought him in and seeing this kind of growth, which is extraordinary. A great South African story, the Uber of trucks. I'll tell you a precursor to this, and it's not legal. So he's doing this legally. I, I was I was looking into um, the business of retreaded tires and how big an industry that is in South Africa. And I, I, I noticed I was out at some dodgy, dingy um, 
place, I can't even remember which province it was, but uh, it was a tire depot. And what the guy said to me was, I, I noticed a lot of very big trucks coming in. And the, the, the signage on it was a bit confusing. So what happens is these are Zimbabwean trucks that come across the border carrying very heavy tonnage of whatever it be, coal or platinum or whatever it is. And they, they transport it to a particular place in South Africa or to Durban or Cape Town. <clears throat> and on their return trip, they will go past tire depots and fill up on, on tires, retreaded tires that they then go and sell in Zimbabwe, which is illegal in South Africa, but legal in Zimbabwe. So they are removing that cost of the return trip with nothing in the back and just supplementing the income. That's and you're just bribing at the border. Mm. Yeah. So you mean it's illegal, but you yes. can get it through the border if Not you... legally, no. Oh, okay. Uh, there's some other, another ridiculous thing is that uh, in the UK, to, you know, from the sublime to the ridiculous, uh, they now... Um, give us all the ladies bras because you're not allowed to sell bras secondhand in the UK. Uh, which and there's there's whole NGOs here in South Africa who are doing that, getting women's bras and giving it to people in this country. It's just there's just so many crazy rules, aren't there? I mean, that's not something that uh, I just mentioned that because <laughs> I, I, I met the lady at South Africa House who, who does this, and I said, but you know, why would why would there be demand? Is it because in the UK, you're not allowed to sell second hand. Mm. So no retreats. My, my, my dear late <laughs> friend Flip uh, used to, he said his opa uh, said to him three things. So one, never trust a Cronier because you do remember that General Cronier gave uh, the Boer forces uh, mm. he, he surrendered. Never put retreads on your car <laughs> and never trust an Englishman who comes into your room and says, I'm here to help you. <laughs> Hopefully that's all behind us now. <clears throat> Speaking of Englishmen, or actually just next door, let's go further afield to Emmanuel Macron. He's up um, facing, he's the incumbent for the upcoming presidential election in France. It's being held in a couple of days, three days, if we are on the 7th. Uh, three days' time, it's going to be the first round of the presidential elections. There's going to be 12 candidates. It's likely to be cut down to two. Now, who is the person up against him? It is a rather controversial figure in politics in France, but I've heard the name before, Marine Le Pen, and her party is far right. And this is, it seems, part of a growing trend um, around the world. And I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, of another far-right candidate that I came across in my travels to Brazil. And that is the current president, Jair Bolsonaro. He was up against a guy from the far left called Fernando Haddad. Haddad was, had the support of the former president, Lula da Silva, who was in prison. And he... Has actually for corruption. For corruption. Mm -hmm. He spent 580 days in prison, but has come out now. Um, he got freed after it was found that the charges were politically motivated. So even under Jair Bolsonaro, uh, those two were going up against each other. B Bolsonaro was anti-equality, anti-black, anti-gay, anti-everything. But he found traction in the Brazilian electorate. And... It seems that there is a, a similar trend emerging here in France. Now, Emmanuel Macron's been there since 2017. He has spent a lot of his time recently, at least, playing international broker. He spent time at the Kremlin trying to talk Vladimir Putin down. Um, well, from 25 meters away at the other end of the table. I mean, that table was ridiculous <laughs> wasn't it so there's there's a lot going on and he maybe hasn't been paying as much attention to what's going on at home as he should have been and that is where the issue of and this is an issue that resonates across the world raising interest rates and rising energy prices have got a lot of french upset and that is where marine le pen is finding traction and um, this is from our partners at the FT. When anybody said to you prior to Donald Trump being elected, 
prior to the Brexit vote, would it actually happen? You'd say, nah, not a great chance. That Marine Le Pen would become president of France. Because she's had a couple of goes, and her father had a few goes as well. That's right. So this is from the NT. Marine Le Pen is doing well in the polls, but, you know, she probably won't win, almost certainly won't win, which reminds me of what people were saying before Trump was elected, that Hillary was certain to win, of what people were saying before the Brexit referendum, and in both those cases, that was not true. And both those things, Trump, Brexit, were huge political moments, kind of revolutions in the West. How much of a revolution would it be for France and for Europe if Le Pen won? It would be a massive moment, you know, the second largest economy in the Eurozone, electing a far-right president, clearly Eurosceptic, against a lot of what the EU stands for. So she's a nationalist, she is conservative, far-right conservative. Emmanuel Macron is considered... Uh, is considered center right and she is far right but she she has a lot of ideas about about nationalism she's not very friendly with nato not very friendly with the eu so it would be a complete change in policy for france where it is at the moment second biggest economy in uh, in in europe in, in the european union and certainly the the biggest military presence uh, as part of nato um, in, uh, coming out of Europe, and uh, Marine Le Pen may have very different views on that. So the first runoff is April the 10th, the second is April the 24th, and then they, they elect the new president can be sworn in by no later than the 13th of May. So we may be saying bonjour, President Marie, Marine Le Pen, in a, in a month's time or so. I've got good friends, good French friends. In fact, we saw them over the weekend. And their reading of it from the ground is that it's all about immigrants. Yes. And that's where Marine Le Pen is getting a lot of action. Uh, that she's a little bit like here in South Africa. And we're going to talk about that, I, I think, a little bit later. But we spoke about it last week, xenophobia uh, and, and how Ndlantla Lux Klamini, or what's his surname? Mokhlaoli. Mokhlaoli. Which is the right surname, by the way? Well, uh, Mokhlaoli. That's what, that, that's what's that's what's on. He calls himself idea. Klamini. Yeah, maybe it's his mom's name. Yeah, it might be. You know, he's out on bail, thousand five hundred bucks. He popped up yesterday or the day before in Dipslut, where somebody was killed overnight. There have been marauding bands of people going around demanding, "Show me your passport! Show me your passport!" When the guy couldn't produce passport, they killed him. This happened in Dipslut last night. Xenophobia. Sure. Just to go to our. Uh, YouTube live channel. We've got a couple of, of comments here, Mike. Uh, Blake Willingdale says, more like empty legs as used in private jet charter. This is when they have to turn around. Uh, I think he's talking about line booker. And uh, Dirk van Valt uh, from We Buy Cars, uh, and who was at our, our conference. Yes. Lovely to have you with us, Dirk. He says, I hope that line booker will create jobs uh, that will help individual driver owners co uh, to start and operate their own businesses. Mm. That would be very, very rewarding in our context. And actually, Dirk, uh, you should have a listen to the interview. It's now up on Spotify uh, on the Biz News Radio channel, the full interview, because Nadia says exactly that. He said, we love working with entrepreneurs. We love the small guys. And uh, they have got, I think, 550 uh, um, businesses that are on uh, line booker who are bidding now for the the work so it's plenty of scale and he says that wherever we can we will promote uh the, these kind of people that, that you want to promote as well tim bosch thank you tim for your comment he says he's, he's enjoying the com combo of alec and apple oh well lovely oh, for anybody wondering why it's the a plus show it's not because alec was such a nerd at school and, and got those sort of grades it's it's so right. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally Alec and Apple. We thought that would make a decent combination. Yeah. And, and A plus is, is yeah. quite a good thing. I mean, uh, did you ever get an A plus at school? Were you one of those smart uh, guys? No. no. Uh, I've got two, two A's in matric, but. Wow. But, uh, yes. Well, I'm impressed. Really impressed. Mike. That's about it. Don't yeah. ask him which subjects. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's more important. <laughs> okay, well, let's get on to my next or my last contribution today. And this was an interview that I did last Friday uh, with Ronnie Aptika. He is uh, an old friend. Uh, in, in the, in the mid-90s, I was exposed to the internet. And the, the internet here in South Africa was, was one of those things that took a little while to get going. 
primarily because Telcom controlled all of the bandwidth. And Telcom's stated policy, so it's, not, it's not something that you're talking about after the fact, was to trickle out the bandwidth and charge huge prices for it so that they could make more profit. And that's the way they played it. And every time that the government had ideas of deregulating, Telcom stopped them deregulating, or they would take them to court and fight them, as actually has happened to a large degree with the, with the spectrum. So it's a dirty area, telecoms in South Africa. Ronnie Aptika, his brother Alon, and David Frankel, uh, who's now one of the top names, almost a, 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 a rule of Boerte type of figure, in New York, though, in private equity. So it's amazing what South Africans are doing. Their result, just you Google him, David Frankel, he's, he's done hugely well with a company called Founders. Ronnie, uh, and, and he was the creative one, and his brother and David were more the business one. And they started Internet uh, Solutions, mm. which today is owned by, well, it was, it was bought by uh, Dimension Data, which is then bought by NTT, the big Japanese giant. They own MWeb. Hi Africa, many of those email addresses, pretty much all of them, sit in this one company that Ronnie Aptika started. And over over the years, we've kept in touch because what Ronnie did was, when being the creator, one when he left the corporate world, he started making movies, and he made a fantastic movie called Material and Material Two. Uh, Riyad Musa, the oh, yes. comedian. I've watched it. Yes, because that's Ronnie. You know, he's just a funny guy. I mean, if you're sitting there with us. It doesn't matter what he's going through. He, he always finds a joke. He always finds a laugh. He's just that kind of a person. Mike, he's been telling me for 15 years about, the, about Ukraine. He says it's not the not Ukraine. Not the Ukraine. Ukraine. And Ronnie's appeal initially was they're the most beautiful woman in the world, he said to me. So, and every time I see him, I'd say, hey, Ron, you married yet? No, no, no. Oh, go to Ukraine. They're the most beautiful <laughs> woman in the world. And the best techies in Europe. So you've got this combination, unique combination for a, a computer nerd, as he calls himself, who wants to make movies and quite likes the company of the of the other sex so, or the fear of sex. And of course, he met and married a Ukrainian lady. They've got a baby, and for the last eight years, they've been living in Kiev. Until uh, they aren't living in Kiev anymore. Yeah. Uh, so he's got an incredibly good insight to what it's like, what Ukraine is like, what, it, what the people are like. What He was there for the, the revolution of dignity, if you recall, when they, they ejected a, 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 a dictator who was aligned with Putin. Yes. And that was after the dictator actually put snipers up there to shoot 100 people yeah. uh, who were protesting against him. And there's a, um, there is a memorial to the martyr. So there's a, there's a heck of a story in Ukraine that people in South Africa don't know. But I thought... What a great opportunity to talk to Ron. We've been republishing some of the stuff from his blog, yeah. and we did that last Friday. It was a it was a really moving interview, and I'll just give you just a small snippet of what happened when he left his home in Kiev. I'll never forget the details. It was like four days, literally, of not sleeping in a car. The journey out of Kiev was it, it, it was scary. Like we were on this highway. It was four lanes in each direction, but on the, the incoming lanes, there was no rules. Everyone just drove. Lots of accidents. Petrol stations with queues around the block. On the one or two lanes that were incoming, there were tanks and military vehicles, and everyone was like hooting in, in support of Ukrainians. But it hadn't hit yet. It hadn't hit yet the extent. We hadn't seen Mariupol flattened and Kharkiv destroyed. And... Uh, if you are interested in Ukraine and want to know a little bit about the, dare I say, real story, the from the ground story, it's on the Biz News channel on YouTube. Go and watch it. It's, uh, it's, it's very moving. Have you by any chance watched a, I think it would classify as a documentary called Winter on Fire or Winter of Fire. It's one of those two that's currently on Netflix that gives the 2013-2014 story of how the Ukrainians deposed that the the, the pro-Putin president they had, who the, the U- Ukrainians were very pro-EU and and joining the EU, and they had a president who had made all sorts of commitments. But when it came to it, uh, they realized Putin had bribed him somehow, 
and he wouldn't sign on. And that's when this popular revolution started rising. And it's it's a f- incredibly moving um, documentary. So if it's not on your list, go and go and look, go and go and watch that. It certainly is now. And just before we leave Ukraine, Elon Musk mm. uh, has been providing Ukraine with. Um, internet connectivity, sending them boxes which link up to his satellite, uh, um, satellite, internet satellites. But what he has done is said he will not ban any Russian-produced yes. content yes. From, uh, the, from, from those satellite boxes. He's not, he's not going to stop that, uh, take that off the internet. So it's a very interesting point here. It's very clear where Elon's sympathies lie. Yeah. But on the other hand, Free speech is something that he he really wants to protect. And I think that also gives you an indication of what might happen in Twitter in in the future. But it's nice. We've got uh, got, uh, Suleiman, who's taking gift of the givers into Ukraine, flying a good South African flag there, and Elon Musk in a similar way assisting the Ukrainians in their defense, even if our government is, well, has has gone absent. Um, Speaking of somebody who was, well... Absent from government. Absent as a good president. Uh, Jacob Zuma, his corruption trial is due to get underway, or is it, next week. Now, for anybody who's ever read this script, where the MPA says Jacob Zuma is due to appear in court, his corruption trial will start. You probably roll your eyes back in your head at this point. But it's still... How old is it, the trial? Where does it go? Decades. It, it's decades old. He's been. It was he, before he was president, wasn't it? Yes. That it started. It relates mm. to his, to his time um, as deputy president. Mm-hmm. Um, so Jacob Zuma and other the other is Thales, the French arms company. They are set to begin the corruption trial. Set to begin on the 11th of April. That is Monday. Just um, a reminder: it is about 12 counts, and it's everything from fraud, corruption, money laundering. Uh, tax evasion, fraud. So he received allegedly an annual bribe of 500,000 rand uh, per annum from Thales for several years. And then what the state is focusing on is 783 payments. It used to be, everybody used to talk about it as 783 charges. But if, if an individual payment or bribe, if you're charged per bribe, it would be 783 charges you're facing. But it's uh, 12 counts, 783 payments, totaling 4.8 million rand. A little bit cheap there, Mr. Zuma, in the grand scheme of things. Tax evasion and fraud charges based on those on those charges. So there should be a shake in there as well. Shabir Sheikh was the one who facilitated those. Yeah, and it's interesting. I I had a look at the NPA statement, then I <laughs> went to look at the ping pong match that goes on between the NPA and the Jacob Zuma Foundation, which is just his mouthpiece, uh, run by Mzwanele Mani. And on the 2nd of April... Not Jimmy. No, you may not call him Jimmy. And on the 2nd of April, it said, and I quote, for the criminal trial to proceed under present conditions would be a travesty of justice and a, a vindictive assault on our constitution. Wow. Now, that's in relation to when... Um, he has tried, he's thrown every single legal impediment in the way to stop uh, the corruption trial from actually starting. So he launched um, an application to challenge the title of, of Billy Down as the prosecutors say, you do not have the title to prosecute me, and neither does the National Prosecuting Authority. You've lost that right because you've been delaying me justice for so long. All of those delays are of his own making. He he didn't win on that. The the judge said no. Actually, Billy Downer may prosecute you. Is this the Stalingrad strategy? Yes, he puts the soul in Stalingrad. Okay, you see the the jump there. But he he then um, after Billy Downer's uh, application to have him removed as a prosecutor failed, he then lodged several applications with the Supreme Court of Appeal, several, and all of them failed. So. How it works is you lodge an appeal with the the trial court and say, um, I'd like to appeal against your judgment. And the judge, they can go, sure, another court will reach a, a, a similar or a different decision. You can go ahead. goes up one rung to the SCA, and the SCA says, 
no, we're not going to entertain your application. And they do that for everybody and anybody. Mm. Now, Jacob Zuma is saying, we are going to approach the president of the Supreme Court of Appeal to, to say, no, you must reconsider. Now, it doesn't work like that, and it's never, ever worked like that. He wants equality before the law, but he bemoans when he isn't treated specially. So if you, I don't know what Advocate Dali and Porfi is going to do come Monday to throw a bus in front of this criminal. Porfu representing Zuma. Advocate Dali and Porfu, yes. EFF yeah. ANC. Yes, that's okay. correct. It's often Strange been bedfellows. often been questioned how and uh, somebody who was the national chair of the economic freedom fighters and for years chanted Zuma must go and Zuma must pay back the money. It just shows maybe he's such an absolute professional that he can separate his political self from his pro from his professional self as an advocate. I still want to know how Advocate Dalempov is getting paid. Um, anyway, this trial is set to get underway on Monday, but do not hold your breath. If you know anything about Jacob Zuma, it's that the next legal impediment is loading. And let's close off on politics as well. That's right. There is one more soundbite to come, Alec, and it is, we spoke about him um, last week. There's an image of him if you're looking on YouTube. This is the South African Human Rights Commission that invited him in. Um, they were looking at... Our president, in, you're talking about. Yes, Sir Earl Ramaphosa was invited in to testify about what he knew, what he didn't know, some of his decisions taken as head of state and commander in chief during last year's riots. And we've spoken about um, a report that came out of the South African, South African Human Rights Commission saying that ultimately... Um, we can blame intelligence, we can blame the police, we can blame whoever, the instigators, of course, all of whom are still out there and we're not sure where they are. Um, but ultimately, who has to take responsibility? The cabinet. And who, more so than anybody else, has to take responsibility out of cabinet is the president. And have we seen any iota of an indication of what actual real accountability looks like. He was asked this question, you're supposed to take accountability, have you honestly? This is what he had to say. We do take responsibility. We did that upfront without even mincing our words, without even seeking to, to hide from it, because there were lapses which we have recognized as commander in chief. Yes, I do take responsibility. As we move beyond this, and as we bring about the changes, we should know that we have been through a real horrendous period. We have looked into an area of real darkness. You know, Alec, I just want to say one thing. There was, there was one of the commissioners who, who made the distinction that in 1960, during the Sharpeville massacre, there were 69 people killed. There were 353, 354, possibly even more people killed during the July riots. Now, we call, we have Human Rights Day on the 21st of March. It's Human Rights Day. It's the Sharpeville massacre that is commemorated. Here we have a quantum of five times more people who have been killed. That's not my comparison. That is a comparison made by a commissioner at the South African Human Rights Commission saying, what is your government doing about this? Well, you heard him there. They're taking responsibility. Michael Apple, Alec Hogg, we'll be back with you at 5, live at 5 every Thursday. Thanks for being with us on Twitter Spaces and on a, uh, YouTube Live. Uh, thanks for all the um, conversations and the, and the inputs. I see, just to close off with Dirk, came back again. He said, Stephen He. Uh, who's a YouTube influencer on academic scores, says that Asians get A's uh, because they're not Bijans. Oh. And he says A is for average. But we are a freakins, not b freakins. <laughs> we go for gold. <laughs> Thank you, Dirk. Thanks, everybody, for being with us. Uh, Mike, as always, uh, we'll be back same time, same place next week. Thanks, Eric. Thanks.